Today I'm presenting to you my highlights of Dr. John McDougall's The Starch Solution. Eat the foods you love, regain your health and lose the weight for good. The Starch Solution is different because it offers a way of eating that keeps you feeling satisfied. You won't feel hungry or deprived because starches are not only healthy, they are also comforting and filling. This is a plan you can follow indefinitely, even when you stray by not following it 100% and its benefits will be with you for a lifetime. In other words, this is not an all or nothing approach. People, including doctors, have an expectation that we will get fatter and sicker as we age. Children are the healthiest, their parents less healthy and the eldest generation suffers from severe and chronic diseases. What happened with my patients on the sugar plantation challenged that expectation. There, the elderly immigrant generation remained trim, active and medication-free into their 90s. They had no diabetes, no heart disease, no arthritis and no cancers of the breast, prostate or colon. Their children were a little heavier and not as healthy. But what really threw me was seeing the youngest generation, the grandchildren of these immigrant families, suffering from the most profound health problems, the same ones I had spent my years learning about during my medical training. My elderly patients on the plantation had immigrated to Hawaii from China, Japan, Korea and the Philippines, where rice and vegetables had been the foundation of their diet. They continued to eat the same way in their new American homes. The second generation, their Hawaiian-born offspring, began to incorporate Western foods into their parents' traditional diet. The third generation cashed in the life-sustaining starch-based diet of their grandparents for a diet rich in meat, dairy and processed foods. My medical training had taught me nothing about the impact of food on health. Nutrition was almost never mentioned in medical school, my textbooks or during my internship or residency. There were very few questions about it on my board exam. Over my years there I saw thousands of people helped by St. Helena's Hospital's talented and caring staff. My lifestyle residential program however never flourished, even as my best-selling books along with top television and radio programs brought us international exposure. Maybe a hospital was not the best venue for a program focused on achieving health through diet rather than through a traditional medical approach. At $4,000 for my primary educational program compared with $100,000 for bypass surgery, perhaps it just wasn't bringing in enough revenue for the hospital. Part 1. Healing with Starch Starch, the traditional diet of people. Have you had your rice today? This Chinese greeting, the equivalent of our how are you, reminds of that the, for the Chinese whether you've eaten rice is the ultimate measure of well-being. Rice is that essential to the Chinese diet. Throughout most of Asia, the average person eats rice two to three times daily. Rice is also an important food in the Middle East, Latin America, Italy and the West Indies. After corn it is the second most produced food worldwide and the world's single most important source of energy, providing more than 20% of calories consumed by humans around the globe. Whether rice in Asia, potatoes in South America, corn in Central America, wheat in Europe or beans, millet, sweet potatoes and barley around the globe, Starch has been at the center of food and nutrition throughout human history. Plants use water, carbon dioxide and energy from the sun to form simple sugars through a process called photosynthesis. The most basic carbohydrate is the simple sugar glucose. Inside the plant's cells, simple sugars are linked into chains, some of them arranged in a straight line, amylose, and others in many branches, amylopectin. When these sugar chains gather in large quantities inside a plant's cells, they form starch grains, also called starch granules, amyloplasts. Starch should be our primary source of digestible carbohydrate. The enzyme amylase in our saliva and intestine breaks down the long carbohydrate chains, turning them back into simple sugars. Digestion is a slow process that gradually releases these simple sugars from the small intestine into the bloodstream, providing our cells with a ready supply of energy. Fruits offer a quick burning energy, mostly in the form of simple sugars, but little of that slow burning sustaining starch. 
As a result, fruits alone won't satisfy your appetites for very long. More important than how much, how often and when we eat is what we eat. Different kinds of animals require different types of diets. We humans are built to thrive on starch. The more rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes and beans we eat, the trimmer, more energetic and healthier we become. There are three basic types of carbohydrates. Sugar, cellulose and starch. Each made up of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen in specific configurations. The simplest of these, sugar, includes sucrose, the granulated sugar you bake into cookies, fructose, which makes fruit taste sweet, lactose, found in milk, and glucose, the simple sugar that comes together in chains to make cellulose and starch. Sugar provides quick and powerful energy because it is so efficiently broken down in the body. The second type of carbohydrate, cellulose, is made up of chains of glucose bonded together by indigestible linkages. It is found in the cell walls of plants and in wood and other organic matter. Our digestive system doesn't have the enzymes to break down cellulose to use it for fuel, but termites do, which is why they can eat through the wood beams of your home. Although we get no energy from them, indigestible carbohydrates like cellulose are valuable to us for their dietary fiber. Starchy foods are plants that are high in long-chain digestible carbohydrates, commonly referred to as complex carbohydrates. Without the addition of starch, a diet of low-calorie leafy greens like lettuce and kale, crucifers like broccoli and cauliflower, and fruits like apples and oranges, will leave you feeling hungry and fatigued. Non-starchy green, yellow and orange vegetables are good for you to eat, but on their own do not give you enough calories to sustain your daily activities and keep you feeling satisfied. Experts have long concluded that primates, humans included, are designed to eat a diet based on plant foods. Our anatomy and physiology require it. The natural diet of our closest relative, the chimpanzee, is almost purely vegetarian, made up mostly of fruits, leaves and perishable vegetable matter. In the dry seasons, when fruit is scarce, chimps eat nuts, seeds, flowers and bark. Genetic testing has demonstrated that humans thrive best on starch. Human and chimpanzee DNA is roughly identical. One of the minor differences is that our genes help us to digest more starch, a crucial evolutionary adjustment. Human saliva produces six to eight times more of the starch-digesting enzyme amylase. Their limited ability to utilize starch confined chimpanzees and other great apes to tropical jungles around the equator, where they found abundant fruits and perishable vegetables all year long to meet their caloric needs. In its pure form, starch is a white, odorless, tasteless powder. Starch granules don't dissolve in water, but heat causes them to swell and turn gelatinous. The starch gel cools into a paste that can be used as thickener, stiffener or glue. When we consume too much fat, the body looks for a place to store it, typically in the belly, buttocks and thighs. The fat you eat is the fat you wear, quite literally. Starches provide energy and an abundance of nutrients without being stored visibly as fat. Starches aren't just good for you, they're also satisfying. The abundant carbohydrates and starches stimulate the sweet taste receptors on the tip of the tongue, where gastronomic pleasure begins. Eat enough starches and your body will release hormones and go through neurological changes that ensure long-term satisfaction. They are naturally great taste and nourishing calories, and the good feeling they give us during and after eating them are the reasons we refer to bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, corn and beans as comfort foods. You would think that starches would promote excess weight gain, but they don't. That's because your body efficiently regulates the use of carbohydrates you get from starch. Even if you consume them in excess, the body will turn them off as heat and energy rather than store much of them as fat. People passionate about starches are healthy and beautiful. Most people have been ingrained with the false notion don't eat starches because starch turns to sugar, which turns to fat, making you gain weight. If this were true, there would be an epidemic of obesity among the 1.73 billion Asians living on rice-based diets. 
At times I wondered whether I might have emotional issues with food. After all, I just downed large quantities and I was still starving. It wasn't until I began eating sufficient amounts of appetite satisfying carbohydrates that I realized my quote unquote mental illness, commonly known as obsessive compulsive overeating, was completely cured by this simple shift in my diet. A wildly held myth holds that the sugars and starches are readily converted into fat, which is then stored visibly in our abdomen, hips and buttocks. If you read the published research, you will see that there is no disagreement about this whatsoever among scientists and that they say that this is incorrect. After eating, we break down the complex carbohydrates and starchy foods into simple sugars. These sugars are absorbed into the bloodstream where they are transported to trillions of cells throughout the body for energy. If you eat more carbohydrate than your body needs, you'll store up to two pounds of it invisibly in the muscles and liver in the form of glycogen. If you eat more carbohydrate than you can use as your daily energy and store as glycogen, you'll burn the remainder off as body heat and through physical movement, other than sports, such as walking to work, typing, yard work and fidgeting. Turning sugars into fats is a process called de novo lipogenesis. Pigs and cows use this process to convert carbohydrates from grains and grasses into calorie dense fats. That's what makes them so appealing as a food source. Bees do it too, converting honey, simple carbohydrate, into wax, fatty acids and alcohols. We humans, on the other hand, are very inefficient at converting carbohydrate to fat. We don't do it under normal conditions. The cost for this conversion is 30% of the calories consumed. Subjects overfed large amounts of simple sugars under experimental laboratory conditions, however, will convert a small amount of carbohydrate to fat. In the 70s, researchers from the Food Science and Human Nutrition Department at Michigan State University, my alma mater, asked 16 moderately overweight college-age men to add 12 slices of white bread at 70 calories a slice or high fiber bread at 50 calories a slice to their diet daily. On average, subjects eating the extra white bread lost 14 pounds, 6.26 kilogram, and those adding the high fiber bread lost 19 pounds, 8.77 kilogram, during the next eight weeks. Appetite appeasing breads worked by replacing the easier to wear fats found in the meats, dairy products and vegetable oils causing them to spontaneously, without any additional conscious thought or effort, lose the weight. After you eat dairy, meats, nuts, oils and other high fat foods, you absorb their fat from your intestine into the bloodstream. From there it is transported to billions of adipose fat cells for storage. This is a very efficient process, it uses up only 3% of the calories you consume to move the fat on your fork and spoon to your body fat. This storage takes place almost effortlessly after every fat-filled meal. If you have your body fat chemically analyzed, it will reveal the kinds of fats you commonly eat. Every year, millions of people lose weight without necessarily improving their health. In fact, these weight loss methods often cause illness. The best example of this negative effect of dieting is the once popular Atkins type low carbohydrate high protein approach. These diets work by severe carbohydrate deprivation, which causes a state of illness with a common outcome of ketosis. When people become sick, they lose their appetite and lose weight. This method for losing extra pounds is analogous to the weight loss seen in people taking cancer, chemotherapy drugs. I realize most people are not as excessive as I am, but most do allow at least one of these overindulgences in their lives and for many, that one extravagance is unending forkfuls of rich foods. For passionate people like us, any attempt at moderation results in continued dependence and recurring failures. The phrase everything in moderation has been preached through much of human history. It didn't work in times past and it doesn't work for most people today. Excess and health need not be mutually exclusive so long as you take a little time to learn which excesses are health enhancing rather than destructive. Five major poisons found in animal foods. Many of the foods you consume without suddenly feeling ill can be equally risky or even more so over the long haul. Meat, poultry, fish, 
seafood, milk and eggs are a slower type of poison, but they are every bit as dangerous as the ones that let you know right away you have made a big mistake. If the ill effects came quickly enough that we easily associated them with the foods that caused them, we would widely recognize animal foods for the real and serious risk they pose. Because the effects are not immediate, we have to dig a little deeper to understand how these foods affect us. With tobacco and alcohol, the risks are nearly universally understood. We know the facts. Meat, poultry, fish, seafood, cheese, milk and eggs, on the other hand, are widely considered an appropriate, even essential part of a healthy diet. Most people eat these risky foods believing that they are nutritious and life-sustaining. There are, actually is no known nutritional advantage to choosing red meat, poultry, dairy or eggs for their high density of particular nutrients. In fact, high nutrient concentrations come at the expense of others. Milk and cheese are deficient in iron, while red meat, poultry and eggs, apart from the shells, provide almost no calcium. These cannot be considered balanced foods. When you eat them, you end up with too much of some nutrients and not enough of others. The ones you get in excess pose real and well-documented risks. All animal foods provide essentially the same nutrition and have roughly the same impact on your health. It doesn't matter whether you grill meat that comes from a cow, pig, sheep, lamb or chicken, scramble eggs from a chicken or dog, or drink milk that comes from a cow, goat or sheep. Industry-specific food marketers would have you believe otherwise, but in fact these foods are so similar, they are essentially equivalent as far as nutrition is concerned. Animal foods are made up of large amounts of protein, fat and cholesterol, with high levels of the sulfur-containing amino acid methionine and dietary acids. Like animal foods, starchy plant foods as a group behave essentially identically to one another. Plant foods are high in carbohydrate and fiber, low in fat and dietary acids and have no significant amount of cholesterol. They also have sufficient but not excess amounts of protein on average. Taking in too much protein, methionine and dietary acid weakens our bones over time. Excess dietary fat and cholesterol clog the arteries and increase the risk of cancer. Excess protein takes its toll even when we are strong and healthy. On average, we lose a quarter of our overall kidney function over 70 years of life just from consuming a diet high in animal protein. Each time we double our protein intake, we increase the amount of calcium excreted in the urine by 50%, escalating our risk for osteoporosis and kidney stones. The body stores dietary fat quite effortlessly as body fat. We also store surplus fat in our liver, heart and muscles. The accumulation of fat in these organs is a hallmark of a condition referred to as insulin resistance, which in turn contributes to heart disease, stroke and type 2 diabetes. When we add to our cholesterol load by eating animal foods, the excess accumulates in our skin and tendons, as well as in the arteries, where it is a major contributor to vascular diseases of the heart and brain, leading to heart attacks and strokes. We eventually metabolize sulfur-containing amino acids, methionine included, into sulfuric acid, one of the most potent acids found in nature. Those potent dietary acids dissolve the bones and cause the kidneys to produce calcium-based stones. Animal foods are loaded with dietary acids. After we eat them, our bones release the alkaline minerals carbonate, citrate and sodium from their generous storehouse to neutralize the acids maintaining the body at the precise pH level needed to sustain life. Over time this process weakens the bones, leading to osteoporosis. Spontaneous healing on a starch-based diet Starches support your body's intrinsic ability to heal by providing a perfect balance of carbohydrate, protein, fiber, fat, vitamins and minerals, along with a balance of antioxidants and other plant-synthesized phytochemicals. For disease to progress, injury must outpace healing. For healing to occur, the opposite must happen. Healing must outpace injury. It's a simple matter of allowing your body to take two or more steps forward for every step back, or better yet, to stop all regressions by very clean living. 
The first sign of the body's spontaneous attempt to mend is inflammation, an essential step in recovering from injury or infection. Our tissues become hot, swollen and painful as plasma and white blood cells move from the blood into the injured areas to do their healing work. The immune system takes over with a cascade of biochemical events that eventually lead to improved health. Within four months of avoiding free oils, oils that have been separated from the foods that originally contained them, like olive and corn oil, and eliminating animal foods from the diet, more than 70% of people with inflammatory arthritis are dramatically improved or cured altogether. Cancers begin and are spread by unhealthy components of a meat and dairy-centric, oil-laden Western diet. Vegetarians are generally healthier and have lower cancer rates compared with others living in the same communities. The fact that a cancer has formed doesn't mean that the body will abandon its attempts at spontaneous healing. Cancer is not a time for losing hope. It is a time for heeding the body's message and taking action. The diet that best prevents disease, best supports the body's innate healing mechanisms and best promotes sustained weight loss is a low-fat diet based on starches with added vegetables and fruits with no animal products or free oils like olive or corn oil. The USDA and the politics of starch Eating more very low-calorie vegetables and fewer starches leaves people feeling hungrier. Think of a plateful of broccoli, cauliflower, lettuce, kale and pea pods for breakfast. Although the United States Department of Agriculture USDA, was created to represent our farm-based population, 150 years later the agency has morphed from the People's Department into the Agribusiness Industries Department, primarily serving the interests of giant consolidated, politically influential food production and distribution corporations. The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine PCRM, has developed its own version of the USDA's original 1956 Basic Four Food Groups recommendations that were late, later reformulated in its familiar Food Guide Pyramid. PCRM's new four food groups recommends five or more daily servings of whole grains, four or more of vegetables, three or more of fruits and two or more of legumes. We are eating the planet to death. It takes about 7 pounds of edible healthy grains to produce just 1 pound of beef, 4 pounds for a pound of pork and 2 pounds for a pound of chicken. As a result of these chronic conditions, 18 million people die from heart disease every year. Yet because these diseases generally come in for the kill only after the victims have passed through their reproductive years, the seeds of further destruction are firmly planted in the unhealthy habits passed along to the next generation. Effects of livestock production on the environment Animal agriculture produces 18% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide equivalents, compared with 14% from all forms of transportation combined. Livestock also generate other toxic gases including nitrous oxide, methane and ammonia. Nitrous oxide has 296 times the global warming potential and methane 23 times of CO2. Ammonia contributes to acid rain and ecosystem acidification. Livestock are the identified culprit in 15 out of 24 important ecosystems that are reported to be in decline. The Earth can support an estimated 1 billion to 2 billion people living at the American standards of income, health, food consumption, personal dignity and freedom. The US share of this population would be 100 to 200 million. This compares with a current world census of 7 billion and a US population of more than 312 million. At the present growth rates, if every human being on Earth were to live according to American standards, including consuming the typical American or European diet, we would need four or more planet Earths to feed, house and care for us all. We have three options for addressing worldwide overpopulation and the problems that result from it. Population control, an unacceptable approach to most, increasing agricultural productivity to feed more people, and changing the way we eat. 
Part 2. The facts about food. When friends ask, where do you get your protein? Should you choose a diet rich in animal proteins or one based on vegetable sources? While the debate rages on, a solid foundation of scientific evidence confirms the answer. A diet with adequate but not excessive protein derived from plants is best. Many people think these animal foods taste good, though they would not like meat so much as salt, sugar and spices in the forms of steak, barbecue and ketchup sauces, which are used to disguise meat's bland taste, were taken away. People living in many rural Asian societies consume 40 to 60 grams of protein a day, mostly from rice, other starches and vegetables. On the western side of the globe, food choices typically are centered around meat and dairy, with these foods providing 100 to 160 grams of daily protein, two to four times that consumed by rural Asians. Dieters on a high protein diet of meat and dairy, such as the Atkins diet, could be consuming 200 to 400 grams of protein a day. Chittenden concluded in 1904 that 35 to 50 grams of protein per day allowed adults to maintain their health and physical fitness. Studies over the past century have consistently corroborated Professor Chittenden's findings. We lose about 3 grams of protein each day through shedding skin, sloughing in the intestine and other miscellaneous losses. Add to this loss other physiological requirements such as growth and repairs and the final tally shows, based on solid scientific research, a total daily protein requirement of about 20 to 30 grams. Proteins are built from 20 amino acids that are connected into chains in varying sequences. It's a bit like the way all of our words in a dictionary are made up of combinations formed from the 26 letters in our alphabet. Plants and microorganisms are able to synthesize all 20 of these amino acids. Humans can synthesize only 12 of them, which we call non-essential because we needn't rely on food to get them already formed. The eight remaining amino acids are called essential because we must get them from the foods we eat. When we eat, our stomach acids and intestinal enzymes break the protein molecules back down into individual amino acids. The body absorbs these amino acids into the bloodstream and then reassembles them to form new proteins. 10 amino acids were essential to a rat's diet. The removal of any one of these essential amino acids from the rat's food led to profound nutritive failure, accompanied by a rapid decline in weight, loss of appetite and eventual death. Feeding the rat's meat, poultry, eggs and or milk prevented this decline. Based on these early experiments with rats, the amino acid pattern found in animal foods was considered the gold standard. Rats grow very rapidly, reaching their full adult size after just 6 months. Humans take about 17 years to fully mature. Rapid growth requires high concentrations of nutrients, including protein and amino acids. Comparing the breast milk of these two species makes the differing nutritional needs crystal clear. Rat breast milk is 10 times higher in protein concentration than human breast milk. Dr. Rose tested the students' need for each individual amino acid by removing one at a time from the diet. When an essential amino acid was given an insufficient quantity for approximately two days, all subjects complained bitterly of similar symptoms, nervous irritability, extreme fatigue and a profound loss of appetite. Even revered experts get the protein story wrong, believing that plant proteins are incomplete in amino acids and therefore cannot alone adequately support our protein needs. The much maligned potato is an ideal food for dieters, low in calories and high in nutrient density. And it is especially beneficial for people with type 2 diabetes, who can be cured by simply shedding a few extra pounds. You don't need to eat foods from animals to have enough protein in your diet. Plant proteins alone can provide enough of these essential and non-essential amino acids as long as sources of dietary protein are varied and caloric intake is high enough to meet energy needs. Protein deficiency doesn't exist except alongside starvation, a condition under which all nutrients, including calories, are in inadequate supply. 
Mother Nature designed her plant foods with a perfect balance of fat, carbohydrate, vitamins and minerals to support optimal health. So long as you have enough food to eat, the question of fulfilling specific nutrient requirements is a moot one. It's all right there. When friends ask, where do you get your calcium? Milk is as pure white as fresh fallen snow and as familiar as a mother's warm touch. If this single food as a sole source of nutrition can sustain a newborn, surely it must be nature's perfect food. Our need for milk supposedly doesn't stop with infancy or childhood. Milk, we are told, strengthens and protects our bones in adulthood as well. These structural beams of the body are built with calcium, so it shouldn't surprise us that milk is essential to our strength and stability. Have you ever met someone suffering from calcium deficiency? Is calcium a key mineral found in copious quantities in the dairy industry's favorite product, without which our bones will fail to hold us upright? Calcium is a basic mineral element that is neither created nor destroyed. Plants absorb calcium and other minerals from the soil through their roots. As the plant grows, that calcium is built into its fabric from root to stem to fruit or vegetable to seed. Plants are the source of calcium and minerals that build strong bones for humans, cows and the largest animals walking the earth. The problem is not finding a way to get enough calcium through what we eat. A plant-based diet of starches, vegetables and fruits will always give you plenty of it. The problem is holding on to that calcium. The best way to increase your calcium retention is to steer clear of animal proteins, including those found in hard cheeses and other dairy foods. It is the most abundant mineral found in the human body, with the average adult carrying around 2.2 pounds of it, about 99% of which is stored as calcium phosphate salts in the bones. Calcium plays crucial roles from forming the skeleton to regulating the nervous system and blood vessel function. Why the bone loss with additional calcium? Their new western diet includes large quantities of animal proteins which come loaded with dietary acids. These acids accelerate the excretion of calcium and other bone minerals into the urine. This increased calcium output outpaces the added calcium in their newly adopted western diet. Three organ systems very efficiently and precisely regulate the body's calcium balance the gastrointestinal tract, the bones and the kidneys. When you overindulge in calcium, your intestinal cells block out much of it, with the kidneys cooperating by eliminating any excess. If your body didn't take these measures to avoid a buildup of excess calcium, the surplus would find its way into your heart, muscles and skin, in addition to your kidneys, eventually leading to heart and kidney failure and even death. When you eat relatively little calcium, on the other hand, the intestine extracts more of it from your food, while the kidneys work to conserve the calcium already in your body. The body so efficiently utilizes this precious mineral that calcium deficiency due to a low calcium diet is essentially unknown in human beings, even in those billions of people who consume calcium from no other sources than plants. Rickets is seen only in children and nearly all cases result from inadequate vitamin D from a lack of sunshine. While it is possible to get rickets from insufficient calcium, a condition called nutritional rickets, it is exceedingly rare and is found only with extremely restricted diets. Worldwide, rates of hip fractures in kidney stones increase with increasing calcium intake. The United States, Canada, Norway, Sweden, Australia and New Zealand have the highest rates of osteoporosis, while the lowest rates are found in rural Asia and rural Africa, where people eat the fewest animal-derived foods and also consume low-calcium diets. Osteoporosis is caused by several controllable factors, the most important being what we eat. The greatest risk comes from food that are high in protein and dietary acids, including meat, poultry, fish, seafood and hard cheeses. Although a case can be made against many of dairy's individual components – protein, fat, cholesterol, sugar, lack of dietary fiber or complex carbohydrates – such microanalyses distract us with oversimplification that misses the larger point. 
Dairy foods make people fat and sick. Plain and simple, dairy foods are not intended for or tolerated by children or adults. Cow's milk is for calves and then only for the first six months of their lives at most. Taking calcium supplements may be dangerous too. Calcium supplements interfere with iron absorption and cause constipation and may cause even greater harm over the long term. Calcium supplements given alone improve bone mineral density but offer little benefit in reducing the risk of fractures and may even increase fracture risk. It is likely that any benefits they do provide are a result of the supplement's alkalinizing effects. Dairy products have been the foods most often recalled by the FDA because of contamination with infectious agents. These foods are commonly tainted with disease-causing bacteria such as Salmonella, Staphylococci, Listeria and deadly E. coli. Dairy may also carry Mycobacterium paratuberculosis, which may cause the life-threatening form of chronic colitis known as Crohn's disease. Dairy foods are also contaminated with viruses, including those known to cause lymphoma and leukemia-like diseases, as well as immune deficiency in cattle. The fact that billions of people the world over grow into normal adults with healthy bones without ever drinking a glass of milk or taking a calcium supplement should make it obvious that we do not need any more calcium in our diet that we get from eating plants. If milk is truly critical to building strong bones, why are humans the only species that continues to drink it after weaning and the only animal that drinks the milk of other species? Confessions of a fish killer by the year 2048, we are warned all fish and seafood species will have collapsed, meaning that they will be either extinct or on the precipice of extinction. Omega-3 and omega-6 fats are called essential because we need them but cannot manufacture them ourselves. That means we must get them through the foods we eat. These plant-derived fats have many important functions such as forming cell membranes and synthesizing hormones. Only plants are able to make a double bond at the third or sixth carbon position. Neither fish nor animals nor humans can create their own omega-3 or omega-6 fats. Research has demonstrated that men, women, children and pregnant women convert small but perfectly adequate quantities of ALA into EPA and DHA without any help from fish. There is no evidence that dementia or any other condition of mental deficiency occurs in populations that take in all of their essential fats from plants and have a low intake of EPA or DHA from fish or supplements. The Japanese diet is based largely on rice. In fact, it is their significant consumption of this starch, not of fish, that explains their better health, trimmer figures, more active lifestyle, youthful appearances and greater longevity. Look at a traditional Japanese meal and you will see that only small amounts of fish are eaten as a condiment atop of a bowl of rice. Eating fish and taking fish oil capsules exposes you to mercury, a natural element found in the earth and released as industrial pollution during certain manufacturing processes. As mercury is dumped into our rivers, streams and oceans, it is converted into highly toxic methylmercury which becomes ever more concentrated as it accumulates up the food chain. Fish at the top of the food chain have the greatest mercury contamination levels. Mercury contaminated seafood is almost the sole source of chronic human mercury poisoning. Serious health risks from mercury poisoning include damage to the heart, kidneys and immune and nervous systems. In the brain, mercury poisoning can cause motor dysfunction, memory loss, learning disabilities, and depressive behavior. Even if eating fish fat or taking fish oil supplements did reduce your risk of nervous and motor disorders, they do not, that benefit would be more than offset by the toxic effects of mercury. Quote, the evidence for the comprehensive benefits of increased fish oil consumption is not as clear cut as protagonists suggest. Unquote. The research refuting any benefit to the heart from eating fish or taking fish oils is clear and convincing. If you are seriously contemplating these substances as a means for preventing or treating heart disease, it is worth your time to carefully consider the evidence. More dangers from consuming fish and fish oils. 
The blood thinning properties of omega-3 fats that may help prevent the formation of clots also increase the chance of bleeding complications. The anti-inflammatory properties of quote-unquote good fats can suppress the immune system, increasing risk for cancer and infection. Omega-3 fats inhibit the performance of insulin, increasing blood sugar levels and aggravating diabetes. While I once enjoyed fishing, now, even though I follow a vegan diet, I would eat a beef steak before I would harm ocean life again. Whether I consume fish or another animal would have roughly the same effect on my health. Fish is not health food. If you believe otherwise, you'd better get your fill now, before the last 10% of the fish population is devastated by those who have been falsely convinced that fish equals healthy eating and minimal environmental impact. The Fat Vegan The fact that vegans are vigilant about what doesn't go into their mouths does not guarantee that they follow good eating habits. In fact, a great number of vegans are overweight and unhealthy. Do vegetable oils prevent heart disease? Many studies show they do not. Serial angiograms of human heart arteries over a year study showed that all three types of fat, saturated animal fat, monounsaturated olive oil, and polyunsaturated omega-3 and omega-6 oils were associated with significant increases in atherosclerotic lesions. Decreasing total fat intake was the only way to stop the lesions from growing. Both omega-3 and omega-6 polyunsaturated oils are found in human atherosclerotic plaques. Thus, they are involved in damaging the arteries and increasing the progression of atherosclerosis. One of the most important predictors of heart attack risk is an elevated level of factor 7, a substance that enables blood clotting. The formation of blood clots inside the arteries causes most heart attacks and strokes. Olive oil increases blood clotting activity by increasing clotting factor 7 as much as animal fats do. Vegetable oils also impair circulation, resulting in a 20% reduction in blood oxygen. Reduced circulation can lead to angina, chest pain, impaired brain function, high blood pressure, fatigue and compromised lung function. One of the main differences among seeds, legumes, grains and nuts is the amount of energy they store, either as fat or carbohydrate. Nuts and seeds store energy mostly as fat, approximately 80% of their calories are from fat and 10% from carbohydrates. Grains and legumes, beans, peas and lentils, store their fuel as carbohydrate. Only about 5-10% to of their calories come from fat, with carbohydrates supplying about 65-80%. to Overindulging in fat-filled nuts and seeds brings about oily skin and excess weight gain at least. For many people, the resulting complications of obesity are type 2 diabetes and degenerative arthritis of the hips, knees and ankles. Fake soy foods lack the vital elements found naturally in the bean's original design. Fiber, carbohydrate, fat, vitamins, minerals and hundreds of beneficial plant chemicals. Once these components are stripped away, the results on your health can be as far-reaching as constipation from a lack of fiber to a reduction in endurance due to carbohydrate deficiency. Concentrated isolated proteins burden the liver and kidneys which play a key role in excreting surplus protein from the body. Adding just 40 grams of concentrated soy protein to experimental subjects' diets has been found to plunge the body into a negative calcium balance, where more of the mineral is excreted through the urine and lost in the bowels than is absorbed by the intestines. Cancer is a real concern when it comes to isolated soy protein, which promotes tumor growth by increasing growth hormone levels. Taller and heavier people have shorter lifespans than do shorter, thinner ones. Researchers believe our best hope for increasing longevity is by taking actions that lower IGF-1 activity. Removing meat, poultry, fish, shellfish, eggs and dairy are well-recognized dietary changes that lower IGF-1 levels. Vegans are industrious. They must shop and read menus carefully, sometimes turning down dinner invitations and social opportunities 
as well as passing up tempt tempting food in situations where they are hungry or the options are limited. It all requires a great deal more effort than the average person is willing to muster. Vegans are duly rewarded for their deep sacrifice when they discover that in fact plants provide all of the protein, amino acids, essential fats, vitamins and minerals they need and that eliminating meat and dairy from their diet provides a great many health benefits. Turning away from the fatty empty calories in harmful processed soy foods and vegetable oils allows vegans to truly shine, inspiring a change in their public perception from being marginalized to being admired for being healthy, trim, active, strong, energetic and committed to changing the world. Just to be on the safe side, stay away from supplements. Supplements can fix deficiencies, not excesses. How many friends and relatives do you know who have suffered from illnesses caused by a vitamin deficiency such as scurvy from vitamin C deficiency, beriberi from insufficient vitamin B1 or pellagra from a lack of niacin? How about protein or essential fatty acid deficiencies? Most likely none. Now turn your vision 180 degrees. How many people do you know who suffer from diseases caused by nutritional excess? How many have health problems from consuming too much fat, cholesterol, sodium, protein or just plain too many calories? Have any of those friends suffering from these excesses significantly reduced their weight by taking supplements? Have any cured their arthritis, hypertension, colitis or even type 2 diabetes with vitamins and minerals? I'm quite sure they have not. Vitamins are organic compounds that cannot be synthesized by the body. In order to remain healthy, we must take in these vitamins by eating food. Of the 13 known vitamins, there are only two that plants don't make, D and B12. Vitamin D is not actually a vitamin at all, but rather a hormone that the body produces when we expose our skin to sunlight. Vitamin B12 is more complicated. Neither plants nor animals synthesize it, rather it is produced by bacteria. B12 is then stored in animal tissue, so one way we can get it is by eating meat. Minerals are in the soil and the plants draw them up into their stems, leaves, flowers and fruits through their root systems. The depleted soil's sales pitch goes like this. You must take supplements because of the poor condition of soil these days. The crops you eat were grown in soil that has been drained of its nutrients from years of over farming. Now the foods that grow in them are also deficient in vitamins and minerals. My brand of supplements will correct this problem for you by providing these missing nutrients. This simply is not true. Plants synthesize vitamins, they are not found in the soil. If a plant is growing, going to bear roots, seeds, flowers and or fruits fit for sale in your market, then it is going to have to produce all of the organic chemicals that are necessary for its own survival. Mineral deficiency from depleted soil is theoretically possible but highly unlikely to affect anyone living in a modern society. The classic example of a mineral deficiency is iodine deficiency which caused the goiter belts of the Great Lakes region nearly a century ago and still causes goiters in underdeveloped parts of the world such as Africa. There are also some rare cases of selenium deficiency and possibly zinc deficiency in underdeveloped countries. These deficiencies occur because of the geographically restricted supply of foods available to these people. Their foods are grown locally, generally within about 25 miles of their village. The soil in their neighborhood may be deficient in one of these minerals, resulting in health problems among those who eat only those local foods. Your risk of suffering from mineral deficiency caused by depleted soil is so incredibly small that a single case would make national headlines. That's because you eat foods grown in a wide variety of soil. Corn grown in Nebraska, grapes from Chile, bananas from Panama and so forth. In the unlikely chance that one food was low in a mineral due to depleted soil, your next bite would likely contain an abundant supply. Beta-carotene is one of about 50 similar naturally occurring active substances in our diet, classified as carotenoids that are especially abundant in colorful fruits and vegetables. 
After nutrients move into the cytoplasm, they attach themselves to the cellular machinery through a specific receptor, the way a key fits into a lock. Beta-carotene, like all of the other biologically active carotenoids, must attach to these specific carotenoid receptors before it can function. When a cell is flooded with one type of carotenoid, in this case beta-carotene from vitamin supplementation, there's overwhelming competition for the carotenoid receptor sites. The other 49 functional carotenoids are displaced by the beta-carotene from their cellular connections, creating deadly nutritional imbalances. The most careful studies on isolated concentrated nutrients have focused on the effects of beta-carotene, vitamin E and folic acid. Randomized controlled trials involving more than 150,000 subjects have proven that taking these and other supplements actually increases your risk for heart disease, cancers and premature death. Studies of supplement use have also reported more fractures in women at risk for osteoporosis, damage to the kidneys in diabetics and an increase in the severity of respiratory infections. Vitamin D is unusual in two ways. First, it is actually a hormone and not a vitamin, even though we call it a vitamin. And second, we get it not from eating food, but rather through exposure to sunlight. While a pill will indeed increase the level of vitamin D in your blood, making it look as if you are benefiting from the vitamin, studies show that getting your D through pills or milk is not very effective at strengthening your bones. Changes in vitamin D levels in the body are affected mostly by sun exposure rather than by diet. Your body stores in your body fat the extra vitamin D you produce during the sunniest months of the year, then slowly releases it during the darker months. For white people, exposing a large part of the skin to the summer sun for 20 to 30 minutes at one time provides about 10,000 international units of vitamin D. The Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition and the National Institutes of Health recommend 200 international units daily, so you can see that 10,000 units is far more than enough. The most dramatic consequence of sunlight deficiency is the bone-deforming childhood disease rickets, which can be corrected by increased sunshine and supplements. A similar softening of the bones in adulthood is called osteomalacia. In most cases, sunlight deficiency causes no symptoms, but it can contribute to diffuse muscle and bone pain and weakness, which may be misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia. Based on the current standards of normal, 30 or more nanograms per milliliter, between 50 and 90% of adults and children are considered deficient in vitamin D. Even people who get quite a lot of sun exposure cannot meet this standard. Recent scientific literature suggests that the level for normal of 30 nanograms per milliliter is exaggerated and should be lowered. I believe a level of 20 or more is adequate. Most children and adults already meet this target. If your test comes back with a level below 20, I suggest the first thing you do is take a second test to rule out laboratory error. If it is still under 20, try spending more time in the sun and test again before considering something so drastic and potentially dangerous as taking vitamin D supplements. Indoor tanning devices for home or commercial use emit the same spectrum of ultraviolet radiation as sunlight. In areas of the world where sunlight hours are limited or when getting outdoors is impossible or impractical, artificial ultraviolet light is the preferred way to correct vitamin D deficiency. Unless you are unwilling or unable to get out in the sun and don't have access to a tanning bed, I hope you will avoid supplements because the benefits are meager and the costs and risks substantial. In my opinion, the adverse effects of vitamin D therapy are understudied, underestimated and underreported. For those who must take vitamin D supplements, such as elderly people who are unable to get outdoors or use a tanning bed, 200 international units per day should be adequate. This is compared with the commonly recommended levels of 2000 to 4000 international units per day of over-the-counter vitamin D to correct low vitamin D blood levels. Vitamin D2 is as effective as vitamin D3 in maintaining circulating concentrations of 25-hydroxyvitamin D. 
Taking 10,000 international units or more per day can cause vitamin D toxicity. Since the usual dietary source of vitamin B12 for omnivores is meat, the obvious conclusion is that those who choose to avoid eating it are destined to become deficient in B12. There is a grain of truth in this concern, but an otherwise healthy vegan's risk of developing a disease from B12 deficiency is extremely rare, less than one chance in a million. Subclinical metabolic changes may be seen, but actual disease is exceedingly uncommon. Our daily requirement is less than 3 micrograms. A microgram is one millionth of a gram. By design, we need to be exposed only to only minuscule amounts of this essential nutrient. Typically, the liver stores 2 to 5 milligrams or 2000 to 5000 micrograms of B12, at least a 3-year reserve. The body has many efficiency mechanisms, including reabsorbing the vitamin in the small intestine and recirculating it for future use. This means it could take you 20 to 30 years after adopting a vegan diet to become B12 deficient. This assumes you take in no new vitamin B12, which is all but impossible, since even on a vegan diet you will take in some B12 through bacterial sources on your food, in your gut and in the environment, even if you aren't trying. Although vitamin B12 is found in animal foods, neither animals nor plants synthesize it. Bacteria make vitamin B12. The intestines of animals, especially ruminants such as cows, goats and sheep, are populated with B12 synthesizing bacteria. Animals store it in their tissues and it gets passed up the food chain when one animal eats another. From the mouth to the anus, the human gut contains bacteria that synthesize vitamin B12. These bacteria are an important reason that disease from B12 deficiency occurs so rarely even among lifelong dedicated vegans. The colon contains the greatest number of bacteria and is where most of our intestinal B12 is produced. However, because B12 is absorbed in the ileum upstream of the colon, this plentiful source of B12 is not immediately available for absorption. The rare case of B12 deficiency may be one important consequence of too much cleanliness. Regardless, I recommend supplementation with vitamin B12. The effects of vitamin B12 deficiency are observed first in the blood and then in the nervous system. In the blood, the deficiency shows up as megaloblastic anemia, characterized by very large blood cells. Even when the megaloblastic anemia is severe, the low red blood cell count doesn't typically cause problems for the patient and the anemia is always cured with vitamin B12 supplementation. The most common nervous system symptoms of B12 deficiency are numbness and tingling in the hands and feet. In the early stages of the deficiency, these neurological problems are entirely reversible. However, prolonged and severe deficiency can cause more serious and lasting nerve damage. All in all, the risk of vitamin B12 deficiency is quite remote. You can see these consequences of a rich, typically American B12 sufficient diet every day. You probably also know some vegetarians and vegans, but you, have you ever met one who has suffered from anemia or nervous system damage as a result of his or her diet? I doubt it. Excessive quantities of B12 appear to be safe and non-toxic. If you are an otherwise healthy vegan and are using typical dosage of B12, 500 micrograms or more per pill, a weekly rather than daily dose of this vitamin will be more than sufficient. B12 is often sold as cyanocobalamin, which some researchers have questioned for treating vitamin B12 deficiency, especially neurological problems. The methylcobalamin and hydroxycobalamin forms of B12 are better choices. Salt and sugar, the scapegoats of the Western diet. I have good news. I'm going to make this adjustment easier by inviting you to add two flavor enhancing ingredients to the food you eat, once you probably assumed we're off limits on a healthy diet, salt and sugar. Are they nutritious? No, but they cause no real harm for most people. Scapegoating salt and sugar deflects attention from the real problems, meat, dairy, fat, oils and processed foods. The major medical concern about salt is that it raises blood pressure 
and high blood pressure, more than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, is a risk factor for heart attack, stroke, and kidney disease. Randomized clinical trials, however, show that reducing high sodium intake by an average of 1725 milligrams, a teaspoon and a half of salt, to 2300 milligrams per day, the current USDA recommendation, lowers the systolic blood pressure, the top number in your blood pressure reading, by 1 to 5 points, and the diastolic, bottom number, by 0.6 to 3 points. On the McDougall diet, with no limitation of the amount of salt added to foods at the table, the average reduction for people starting out with this level of blood pressure, 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury or greater, is 15 points systolic and 13 points diastolic in just 7 days. There was no strong evidence of benefit from salt restriction and that this restriction increased the risk of death in people with congestive heart failure. Why would cutting back on salt harm your cardiovascular system and increase your risk of dying? We are physiologically designed to seek out and eat salt. When we do not eat enough of it, the body changes in ways that include increasing its production of adrenal hormones, reducing salt losses from the kidneys and skin, and many other adjustments that help us to retain salt. Furthermore, salt restriction raises cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Over the long term, stresses caused by these physiological adaptations for survival may injure our blood vessels and lead to more heart attacks and strokes. The natural instinct to eat salt in balance with all of the other healthy components of food was well and good until the food industry found clever ways to turn our drives against us. Nearly all of the salt we now eat, 80% of it, is processed into our foods rather than added at the table. That leaves most people following a western diet with no choice but to eat loads of salt with the highest levels found in the unhealthiest foods, processed meats, cheeses and packaged foods. When we blame salt we are colluding with the food companies that have fooled us into focusing our attention on an innocent bystander when the real culprit is the foods that have been overly salted. Salt also tricks us into eating animal derived foods which without excessive amounts of it would be altogether unappealing. It's not the salt but the bacon that makes us fat and sick. You need only as little as 50 milligrams of sodium per day to meet your baseline metabolic requirements. A diet based on starches, vegetables and fruits with no added sodium contributes about 200 to 500 milligrams. So there is no reason for concern that you won't get enough even without adding salt. Assuming the food was not prepared with sodium, you could add up to three quarters of a teaspoon of salt per day and still stay within the USDA's dietary guidelines. I suggest adding salt at the table rather than in cooking because salt added during cooking largely dissipates into the mix of other ingredients, losing the pleasurable flavor. Your big payoff is when you add salt to the surface of your food, it contacts your tongue directly. Sugar is clearly a better choice for enhancing flavor than fats and oils, which contribute two to a quarter times more calories per gram than pure white sugar and cause a host of health problems. Feel free to sprinkle a little brown sugar over your oatmeal, drizzle maple syrup over your pancakes, add a bit of refined sugar to a fruit dessert or dress up your starches and vegetables with sweetened sauces. Studies show that people who eat more simple sugar tend to take in fewer calories altogether, which means less chance of becoming overweight. One reason for this is that people who eat more simple and complex sugars generally eat less fat, the real culprit in weight gain and illness. Type 2 diabetes is a direct result of obesity. Worldwide, the populations with the lowest rates of diabetes are those that eat the most carbohydrate. Type 2 diabetes is all but unknown in rural Asia, Africa, Mexico and Peru, where a higher carbohydrate diet is the cultural norm. As carbohydrates become increasingly refined, they become less efficient in inhibiting weight gain and increasing weight loss. Refined sugars and flours are referred to as empty calories because most essential nutrients have been removed in their manufacturing. Complex carbohydrates in the form of whole starches like brown rice, whole oats, corn, white potatoes and sweet potatoes are the best route to weight loss and good health. 
you've probably heard a lot recently about the glycemic index, GI, which measures the rise in blood sugar over two to three hours after we eat. Your blood sugar is supposed to rise after you eat. It's a good thing, not the sign of a problem. Consumers and medical professionals alike assume that foods with a higher GI, such as potatoes and rice, that cause some of the higher increases in blood sugar seen after a meal are harmful and should be avoided. Obesity and type 2 diabetes have reached epidemic proportions as people shun healthy carbohydrates in part because of their GI ratings and replace them with unhealthy but very low GI foods like vegetable oils, meats and cheeses. Rising blood sugar triggers satiety, telling you it's time to stop eating. Rather than causing you to eat too much and gain weight, high GI foods help you to feel satisfied and thus to stop eating. Think about a slice of pizza dripping with oily cheese and a nice big slice of chocolate cake piled high with rich frosting versus a bag of raw carrots and some plain boiled potatoes. Which of these foods are healthier? You won't have any trouble picking the carrots and potatoes, which have the lower GI, the pizza and the cake. Carbohydrates are commonly implicated in increasing triglycerides, the elevated blood fat levels associated with risk for heart disease and strokes. But in order to demonstrate a rise in triglycerides from eating carbohydrates in experimental studies, subjects must eat a great deal of simple sugars and refined flours and or must continue to eat after they feel full to the point of discomfort. Widespread tooth decay is largely a modern phenomenon beginning with the production of refined foods and the widespread use of sugars in food. Bacteria in your mouth convert simple sugars into strong acids and these acids can eat through the protective enamel coating on your teeth to cause decay. A diet only works to the extent that you stay on it. The starch solution is not a religion based on perfection, but rather a practical means to solve many everyday problems. These two highly pleasurable ingredients, salt and sugar, along with a variety of spices will increase your enjoyment of your foods and help you stick with the starch solution for a lifetime. Part three, living the solution. Practicing the starch solution. One of the most exciting things about the starch solution is that it is not a diet in the traditional sense of restricting how much you can eat. So long as you choose the right foods, you can always eat until you feel comfortably full and satisfied. So long as you eat only the permitted ingredients, you can combine them in any way you like in any preparation to suit your own taste. You can eat a wide variety or limit your choices to a few simple dishes repeated over and over again. The cardinal rule of the starch solution is that you must center the food on your plate around starches adding color and flavor with non-starchy vegetables and fruits. Use fat-free seasonings and sauces generously to add variety to your meals and make them more interesting. The following foods are never part of a healthy diet and should be meticulously avoided if you are to benefit from the starch solution. Meat such as beef, pork and lamb. Poultry such as chicken, turkey and duck. Dairy foods such as milk, cheese, yogurt and sour cream eggs, animal fats such as lard and butter, vegetable oils including olive, corn, flaxseed, canola and safflower oils, processed and packaged foods except for the ones containing only permitted ingredients. Although diverging from the plan once or twice a year will not undo all of its benefits, it can be a slippery slope. If you indulge too often, you may find it difficult to get back on track. For most people, eliminating a food altogether is far easier than figuring out when it is okay to eat it. I recommend staying away from these foods altogether all of the time for the rest of your life. It may seem inconceivable now, but once you make the commitment and experience the profound effects, you will not miss the foods you give up. Most starches can be classified as whole grains, legumes or starchy vegetables. Non-starchy vegetables are a plentiful source of vitamins and minerals, fiber and water. On their own, these vegetables don't provide enough calories to make them a filling meal, but they do add flavor, aroma, texture, 
color and variety to the plate. Non-starchy vegetables are the green, yellow, orange and more multicolored ones and they come in many forms. Fruits offer a sweet addition, a punctuating conclusion to a meal or satisfying between meal snack. If you seek to accelerate your weight loss or if you suffer from a chronic disease or are on the cusp of developing one, I recommend avoiding these foods altogether. Or if on the other hand you are already happy with your weight or are not in a hurry to lose and you do not suffer from a chronic illness, then you might wish to consider including small quantities of these higher calorie foods in your starch-based meals. Avocados, dried fruits, flowers, whole grain, white, all-purpose, fruits and vegetable juices, nuts, peanuts and peanut butter, seeds, simple sugars, that is table sugar, maple syrup, molasses, agave. The best way to ensure that you stick with the start solution is to keep an assortment of healthy ingredients at, on hand in your kitchen. A well-stocked pantry and refrigerator will make the difference between success and failure. There will be times when you just don't feel like cooking or you don't have time. It is for these occasions that we've suggested keeping your pantry shelves, refrigerator and freezer well stocked. Preparing, portioning and refrigerating or freezing foods in advance when you do have time to cook leaves you with easy meals for later. In fact many soups, stews and casseroles taste even better the second day. Remember, if your favorite dinner is a plate of beans and rice with salsa and corn tortillas or a big bowl of soup with whole grain bread or a sweet potato with steamed broccoli, there is absolutely no reason not to enjoy that same food day after day and night after night. These foods are healthy. There is no reason to eat them only occasionally or in moderation. Variety is good if you like variety, but some people find comfort in eating the foods they know and love on a regular basis. When you go out to eat with friends or family, as a break from cooking at home or to celebrate a special occasion, you will have to put some thought into it. You will also need to be prepared to politely stick to your plan when dining in a friend's home. Ethnic restaurants like Mexican, Chinese or Thai tend to offer the best options. Remember that these populations have traditionally followed a starch-based diet. Grains, legumes and starchy vegetables are some of the least expensive foods you can buy. Other vegetables and fruits may be more costly, especially if you purchase organic. Many consumers turn to fast food restaurants to reduce their dining out costs, but if you compare the quote-unquote bargain of a fast food meal to the cost of a starch-based diet, you will quickly see the outrageous cost of eating in fast food outlets from $9 to $21 per person for a full day's worth of fast food meals, 2500 calories. About $14 per person per day is the average cost. In comparison, a starch-based diet with added fruits, vegetables and condiments will cost you about $3 per person per day. Starches are among the least expensive foods in the supermarket. Getting your full daily supply of calories from starches alone would cost you less than $1.50 for 2,500 calories. The net savings from switching your 2,500 calories per day from fast foods to starch-based meals is $11 per person per day, $14 minus $3. Over the course of a year, this puts savings in your pocket of more than $4,000. The 7 day sure start plan. The rules of the 7 day sure start plan are easy to follow. 1. Eat more starch. Eat as much starch as you like. Don't go hungry. 2. Choose the least processed starches and other foods you can find. For example, brown rice is better than white. Cooked whole grains are better than products made with white flour. 3. Eat plenty of vegetables and fruits. 4. Eliminate animal food from your diet, including meat, poultry, fish, eggs, cheese and milk. 5. Keep your fat intake as low as possible, enjoying avocado, coconut, other nuts and seeds only as occasional treats. 6. Avoid any added fat in your food, including butter, margarine and all vegetable oils, and even olive oil. 7. When eating soy foods, skip those that are highly processed, for example soy burgers, and enjoy minimally processed soy foods like tofu, edamame, soybeans, 
and soy milk as infrequent additions in small quantities. They're richer than you think. 8. Go easy on sugar and salt, but don't sweat the unimportant stuff. They're usually the scapegoat, not the problem. Whenever possible, add them to the surface of the foods. Two tips help them, above all others, to get comfortable with this new style of eating. Avoid temptation by keeping unhealthy foods you crave out of your home and workplace. If a food feels like an addictive drug when you eat it, you have a hard time stopping, it's not a good food to keep around. Prepare or purchase healthy foods you enjoy so there is always something you can feel good about eating, especially when you are in a hurry. Keep your refrigerator and cupboards filled with good foods you can grab on the go and bring along with you to work or on the road. If on day 5 you are in the mood for the menu on day 3, no problem, swap them. If you really enjoyed the lunch on day 2, follow that menu twice or three times or seven. In fact, if you simply adore sweet potatoes and broccoli, you can eat them for breakfast, lunch, dinner and between meal snacks every day of the week for many years. As you have learned in this book, starches along with vegetables and fruits provide complete nutrition. Although the menus are based on three meals per day, the number of times you eat is not important. You can eat once a day or 14 times. Eat when you are hungry and stop when you are satisfied. If you do that, it makes no difference how often you eat. The only imperatives are that you eat plenty of starch, supplemented with fruits and vegetables, avoid vegetable oils and animal-based foods, and eat rich foods like nuts, seeds, minimally processed soy products, and dried fruits and juices in moderation, if at all. The less of these richer foods you eat, the more dramatic your weight loss and health improvement will be. If you are already at your desired weight or you are underweight, you can use these richer plant foods to keep your weight in check. Achieving maximum weight loss. Follow this more restricted version of the starch solution to lose more weight more rapidly. Increase the amount of non-starchy green, yellow and orange vegetables you eat to about one third to one half of the food on your plate. Fill the remainder of your plate with starch. Avoid all simple sugars including dried fruits and juices. Keep fresh fruits to one or two a day. Avoid flours and flour products, including breads, bagels and pastas. Steer clear of all high-fat plant foods, such as nuts, seeds, avocados, olives and soy-based foods. Eat many small meals a day rather than one or two large ones. Eat a simple meal plan like sweet potatoes and broccoli or beans and rice with a non-starchy vegetable. Greater variety results in more food consumed. Don't eat out at restaurants. Exercise more frequently to burn more calories and to tame an overactive appetite. Enjoyment and satisfaction are the keys to successful diet change and weight loss. Avoid becoming too overzealous about eating very low calorie green, yellow and orange vegetables and reducing the starches you eat so much that you feel hungry all the time. It will make the program difficult to follow and increase your risk of giving it up. If you feel hungry, eat more starches. If you keep your meals simple, as we do, you won't find yourself overwhelmed with piles of vegetables waiting to be chopped or complicated preparations requiring every pan and utensil in the kitchen, hours of work and burdensome cleanup. In fact, we eat mostly one dish meals that can be prepared using just one or two pots and pans. Another frequent misconception is that a complete dinner calls for putting several different dishes on the table. At first I thought that too. But time has taught me that some of the best meals are composed of a casserole or a pot of soup with a simple green salad and a loaf of whole grain bread. Amen.